Hi everybody. Uh, for this video, I would like to present a few ideas I've been tossing around in my mind uh, as far as possible house rules uh, for Axis and Allies. Uh, not specific to a particular game. Uh, I just have 1942 Second Edition out here uh, to kind of serve as illustration. I would like to hear what you guys think about each one of these uh, ideas. Um, and again, there might be some things that don't pertain to this particular game, but might pertain to uh, Global 1940 uh, or maybe 1914 or some other version. Uh, the first thing, oh, and also, to give credit where credit's due, some of these things are my ideas, some of them uh, I've read about, uh, maybe on accessandallies.org or seen in somebody else's video, uh, or from playing with uh, Dare Kunzler. There are a few house rules they have that I really like that I'm going to mention. Um, so not all of these are mine, where I give credit where credit's due. Uh, to start with, uh, technology. This is something that there uh, used to be in the first couple versions of Axis and Allies, and I believe uh, they started to do away with it. I'm not sure if Global has it, but 42 Second Edition does not, and 1914 doesn't, unless you count tanks, but you don't have to research those or anything. Uh, but more than just technology, I'm talking about a progressive technology tree. So let's say there are maybe four branches. Uh, maybe one's focused on infantry, one is focused on tanks, one's focused on artillery, that sort of thing. And um, But before you can research the really, really good tank technology, or the really good fighter technology, you have to research the one that comes before it. And each one builds uh, over time. Or each one, you have to get the first one before you can get the second one, and then if there's a third one, you'd have to get the first two before you get that. And I like this because... Uh, no one can zip ahead and get atomic bombs or something like that on the very first turn and then win the game or get some really advanced technology even if they roll really well. Uh, but they are still able to get something. Um, in addition to that, um, and this is something in some versions, at least one version of Axis and Allies, if you pay to research and you do not succeed... Uh, you're allowed to keep a little chip, and then you can keep rolling uh, every turn until you finally get something, but then all your chips go away. And so what I propose to modify that, in addition to the uh, successive research, would be that you still pay per roll, uh, but you succeed on a 5 or a 6, so you have slightly better, uh, better odds, or actually your odds are 100% better, because in regular Axis and Allies, you had to roll a specific number. So you can get it on a 5 or a 6, or you can just pay 20, so that'd be 5, uh, five IPCs, just as an example, uh, per roll. But maybe you don't get anything. Or you can pay 20 IPCs, which is a pretty hefty sum of money, to just automatically get the technology. Um, and I could see, especially if the... Uh, let's say there are three tiers of technology and the third one is really, really good, maybe you're removing that guarantee for that tier, but for the other tiers, all except the uh, best of the best, uh, would have a guarantee research element to them. Moving on, uh, diplomacy. So we don't really have neutrals in this version of the game that we're looking at, but we do in Global and in 1914. And in those versions, at least in 1914, and I believe this is correct, in Global, you just, uh, if it leans your way, that neutral, you just move units there and you get it. If it doesn't lean either way and you move units in, uh, the, the uh, neutral joins the opposing uh, force. What I propose is uh, still having neutrals that lean one way or the other, but uh, instead of just moving forces into them, you actually have to um, use diplomacy. And the way you would do that is uh, either each country or perhaps each alliance, uh, once per round, uh, would get to roll dice and say, hey, we're going to try and uh, either bring X neutral in the war on our side or we're going to try and persuade them. Maybe it's a neutral that leans... 
uh, for the opposing side. So if we're talking 1914, maybe it's, it's Romania and it leans towards the Allies. Maybe the Central Powers want to use their diplomacy to pull it to true neutral. And so there'd be uh, some mechanic where they would roll some dice and if they get a certain amount, um, that would either sway the country or they'd have to pay a certain amount on a successful roll uh, to sway that country. Um, in World War, or in 1914, another example, and I've gotten a lot of feedback on this, you know, what about Italy? Should Italy lose its first turn? Should Italy be neutral the first turn? Maybe, uh, to use this mechanic there, Italy should be a neutral that leans allies, and so the allies have a chance to completely pull it in, but the central powers would also have a chance to move it neutral and then eventually maybe get Italy to join on its side. Uh, same thing with the United States. So it would add some uh, new dynamics to the game uh, to do it that way. Uh, let's see here. Oh, and another thing um, that I've been toying around with are trenches. And that might be more of a World War I um, uh, type of thing. But in World War II, you could think of them as pillboxes or something like that. It doesn't make sense that a nation should be able to pay a certain amount um, or some rule around it to have units uh, dig trenches. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. I know that's something that uh, Der Kunzler does on his side, um, and I think that rule works really well. Sorry about that, I'm not sure what my camera was doing. We'll zoom back. My camera apparently has a life of its own. Sorry about the zooming in and out that's going on. Um, let's see here, what else do I have? I feel like I'm forgetting something. Oh yeah, here we go. Um, I do like the economic and political collapse from uh, 1914, and so I see possibly integrating that uh, into other versions, um, and maybe just to, for simplicity, maybe just have an economic collapse. If you lose your capital or you lose 50% of your starting production, uh, you're an economic collapse, and if you go so many turns, maybe two full turns, uh, an economic collapse without pulling out of it at the end of your the second turn, uh, that maybe you're in political collapse. Um, still toying around with should the political collapse rules be the same as in 1914, or should we modify them, uh, maybe to say that uh, any territory that has infantry in it, um, all, let's or all your units are. Uh, removed from the game except territories with infantry and any of those territories you're reduced to one infantry that doesn't fight but it defends or something like that. Um, I like uh, the idea of having a tactical retreat that's another thing from Der Kunzler so um, let's say uh, somebody attacks attacker rolls, defender rolls, uh, after the first round defender wants to retreat uh, attacker uh, if defender wants, chooses to retreat, it can, but the attacker gets a second round of attacking, and then instead of firing back, the defender retreats. Um, in some cases, that might be more useful than others, but that's a nice house rule, I think. Uh, another one would be, uh, and this is a totally new one, something I call secret moves. So basically, once per... Um, like a, maybe a once per game thing, once per game per country. Any unit that did not move on its turn, uh, maybe you denote it by putting a little chip there or something like that. Um, so it didn't move on its turn and it basically gets uh, an extra movement next turn. So uh, the you have the disadvantage of it possibly getting blocked, but at the same time, your enemy might not necessarily know where you're going to be coming from, which could be useful maybe in a situation like in this game over in the Eastern Front, um, where there are a lot of places Germany could attack or Russia could attack and try and defend. If there's suddenly an army in one of those territories uh, and uh, Germany doesn't know, let's say it's Russian, and the Russians have guys here and down here and over here, and Russia does its secret move, and suddenly Germany doesn't know where the forces are massing, um, that could uh, that could really have a big impact. It could um, 
cause one or both sides to do something they wouldn't otherwise do. Um, another rule, and this comes from a little bit from 1914, is what I'm calling the thou shalt not pass rule. So what this does, or this could do, what I see this doing, is um, in normal axis and allies, aside from 1914, when you attack, you keep rolling, attacker keeps going until they either retreat, take the territory, or all of their men are killed. In 1914, you roll one round of combat, and if neither side is destroyed, you both sit in the territory uh, contesting it. Well, what I would propose in uh, maybe a World War II version, the thou shalt not pass rule basically uh, in a designated territory uses the 1914 rules. So I would have this apply to capitals uh, and then maybe once every couple of turns each nation can uh, apply, it can say this territory here is going to be a thou shalt not pass territory or something like that and then it stays that way for the rest of the game. Um, basically you fight to the last man. Uh, I do think that um, it is kind of easy with the 1914 rule to pin down uh, armies. And so if this were uh, World War II, I would propose at least two rounds of combat, maybe three rounds of combat, uh, so that units aren't completely pinned down uh, super, super easy. And then the last thing that I want to mention is uh, what I call the press the attack. So this would be, uh, let's say you have some tanks, they have multiple movement, um, but they only move one space. Let's say Germany's in Ukraine, it's going to attack uh, Caucasus. And tanks have two movement, they only moved one to uh, use one to move here. Uh, and let's say they wipe everything out in the first turn. This rule says that these tanks, because they still have another movement, could move somewhere else. Uh, now I'm toying around with whether they should be able to move anywhere or just to another territory that doesn't have any enemy units in it. I uh, have not made up my mind on that point yet. Uh, let's see here. I think that is everything uh, that I wanted to mention. Uh, so if you guys could give me some feedback on it, like I said, several of these came, things came from uh, other Axis and Allies games or our variations on them. Uh, some of them I've uh, heard from other house rules, especially Der Kunzler. Uh, he has some really good house rules, and uh, several of the things I've mentioned uh, are things that he uses or variants on those things. Um, so if you guys could give me some feedback, I definitely would appreciate it. Uh, and if you have any uh, good ideas for house rules, let me know. Uh, I would love to hear those too. Thanks.